This interview was recorded on May 4th, 2021. Hi, I'm Lan Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Shafali Nayak. Based in Wisconsin, Shafali is, a di- data- Shafali is a data science professional who specializes in statistical and machine learning, as well as strategy development and risk management. You can follow her on Instagram at keep underscore on underscore learning underscore, and check out her profile on LinkedIn. Shafali is the author of three books that are for sale on LeanPub, What Just Happened, Descript- Descriptive Statistics, and Explorer's Guide to Data, Sampling Techniques, a Comprehensive Comprehensive overview and big data analytics, a data scientist viewpoint. In this interview, we're going to talk about her background and career, professional interests, her books, and at the end, we're going to talk about her experience as a self published author. So, thank you very much for being on the Front Matter podcast. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be on this podcast. Yeah, we're, really, we're very glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their own origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into a career involving data science and management consulting and so many other interesting things. Yes. Uh, happy to share. So I grew up in India and uh, from- And education-wise, I hold a bachelor's and a master's in statistics, and I love numbers. That's how I got into that field. And uh, after that, I did have about a 12-year career and still going on in the uh, data science space. And I have done a fair amount of projects revolving around credit and fraud risk. So those are kind of super intense when it comes to data science, when it comes to machine learning algorithms. And it's definitely the up and uh, coming field in the field of data science. And primarily, I have been in the field or the domain of banking and financial industries. So that's a bit about me on uh, the professional or the working front. I also have uh, written three books in the field of data science, like you just mentioned, the descriptive statistics, the sampling techniques, and big data. And uh, around what time did you move to the United States? So I just recently moved to the United States, and it has been around the pandemic year. So I came to the United States just when the pandemic hit the global scenario. So I came about a year ago into the United States. Oh, that must have been uh, an especially interesting experience. Yeah, so it it has been, um, I would say everyone has put their fair share of, um, it has been a fair share of difficulty for everyone and everybody's kind of putting their emotional support or they have been trying to get connected with their loved ones virtually and trying to make this happen. I say um, it was definitely a huge con because we were like, having a lot of uh, our friends, acquaintances, or family members who were in a situation that required to be hospitalized and those kind of things. But um, I think the pro of it is that all of us have been there for each other and have been trying to use the digital and the technology that is available to us to our fullest um, resources. So I think that has been a, a blessing that we had that as an option available and with Zoom and all of this coming up, I think that kind of helped us to keep connected across the globe. It must have been particularly strange to move to a new country and then have the door closed behind you. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was a little bit, I would not say it is, uh, it has not been stressful. It has definitely been a little bit of uh, uh, stress when you just come into a new country and like the doors close, right? So you just want to know when is it going to open. You always want to have those options. Um, I don't know what it is about uh, people who show up as authors on LeanPub, but many of them are people who've moved around from one country to another. I I myself have have had the experience. Um, So I always like to ask when I find out that someone's done that. um, uh, What were things like, you know, what was the biggest change for you or what what kind of was the most surprising thing that you encountered, I guess, uh, assuming in Wisconsin? Well, uh, I would say uh, the best part about Wisconsin is that you get to experience all the four seasons. So I have never been, uh, I have never experienced a winter and I have never experienced the snow. So this was like a, a great experience for me. And at the same time, I did get to see all the four seasons in its full glory. So I would say that definitely is a plus. And I love traveling and I have Uh, like some of the self-published authors traveled around quite a bit. So that's definitely uh, 
hitting my uh, check or to-do list saying that I did travel to this part of the country. Yeah, that's really, that's really great. You, you, the way you describe the, the impact of sort of experiencing all four seasons. Um, I grew up in a place called Saskatchewan in Southern Saskatchewan in Canada, where in the South, in the summer, it's basically a semi-desert and in the winter, it goes down to like minus 40. So pretty dramatic, just I assume a lot like Wisconsin. Yes. And now, now I live next to the sea. And so it's very temperate all year. There's like, you know, basically a 15 degree variation from high to low kind of <laughs> yes, <laughs> exaggerating yes, so. a bit, but it, it, you do miss it when you're used to it. And it's, it's interesting to hear about someone being excited to experience it for the first time. Yes, absolutely. And I echo that thought and I echo that feeling because I come from Mumbai originally. And that is definitely, like you mentioned, like a beach or a coastal area. So it's very humid. It's very temperate through the year. It's pretty much like a flat season. You do have showers and you do have a little bit of uh, winter, but this is definitely not the winter that we're talking about. So it's definitely extremes. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is I know you do work in, in addition, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about your books and your data science experience and, and things like that in a bit, but I know that you, you do work on wellness and meditation and mindfulness and things like that. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that aspect of, of what you do with your time. Yeah, so I did realize that uh, meditation is definitely something that's keeping me grounded. And that's something that I have been practicing for nearly probably three decades right now. And I what I do take for granted that my state of mind is that I'm focused on the present. It's something that does require a lot of working uh, through the year. So it's just 10 minutes every day, but it does make a lot of difference over a period of time. And things that I take for granted, like my state of mind right now, where I'm completely focused on the present moment. That's something that does not come very naturally to a lot of us. And at times we do kind of waver into the past or into the present, into the future. So we kind of have that feeling of dwelling in the past and saying that we could have done something better or being very anxious about what the future holds. And I think even the pandemic is a situation where meditation definitely helps because everybody is like wondering what could have been done and how is it that it's going to look in the future? So this is something that I've been practicing. And at the same time, I have been kind of taking some classes where I kind of help uh, some people. And it's kind of a, a volunteer activity that I do. That's really interesting. Um, uh, I'm definitely one of those people who obsesses about like some mistake I might have made 20 years ago, all of a sudden that's in my head and I'm completely captured by it. And then the next minute, I'm totally concerned about something that might happen 20 years from now. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. and then whether I'm making the right decisions about that in, in the moment. Um, so, what what is the form of meditation that you practice? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how how does it help? So, uh, I do practice Sahaj Yoga meditation. So, it has been practiced in hundred plus countries. I think it would be hundred twenty plus maybe right now. It was founded by Her Holiness Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi in the year nineteen seventy. And it is something that has been practiced uh, all across the globe. It's a very scientific way of uh, doing the meditation, wherein you take a couple of affirmations, you try to balance the left and the right or the past and the future, and you try to come into this moment where you do not have much of thoughts. You're basically centered or focused in the present moment. And that actually helps us to become more productive because at times, we do realize that when we are thinking about the past, we think about the future, we tend to lose uh, the present moment. And we realize after two or three hours that we just didn't do anything for those two or three hours. So this kind of helps keep centered. And it is a very scientific way of doing it. And there are sessions all across the globe, all across the time zones. So it's more like a volunteer activity where we use the uh, water or the fire element. And we just kind of... It's, it's a no cost kind of thing. It's just 10 minutes of meditation per day. And that has incredible results because it helps in both creativity and being focused. And when you're talking about focus, I thought I might bring up something very specific, which is which I, which I definitely suffer from, uh, which is when you're in front of a screen all day, like we all are basically now, I mean, unless you're working in the services industry and healthcare and taking care of people and stuff where it's face to face, you know, a lot of a typical professional nowadays, you know, even if they're, they were formerly a courtroom lawyer, you know, might be spending most of their time on Zoom like we are right now. And um, 
I particularly have the problem that I think a lot of other people have of like obsessively wanting to check the news, for example. Um, you know, uh, can can meditation help with things like that by keeping you focused and keeping your brain from kind of leaping off into all these potential areas all the time? Yes, absolutely. Because I do see that that the moment we do turn on the news, we kind of react. We start reacting and we have opinions. So we have opinions to everything. So this kind of helps that we kind of integrate our opinions, our reactions. And if we can do something, if we can help, then we go full. Uh, I mean, we go, go full enthusiastic and we try to help out the best we can. But we kind of curb the reactions and the opinions that we have and we just stop discussing and discussing and then there's no actions so it's basically bringing down the reactions and taking some actions where we can oh that's really fascinating so in addition to trying to control your one feature of it is trying to control your reactions right and so if you find it, one thing you might want to do is try to prevent yourself from being uncontrollably stimulated but if you do find yourself stimulated at least try and turn that into something yeah uh, of, that's productive in some way yeah because that i think that a lot of us do tend to just put on the news and say why is it going on what is happening and we tend to have these reactions but then i think it makes more sense to kind of think of all the possible actions that we can take in our surroundings and all the things that we can do rather than just have these un unnecessary reactions the way i kind of put it is if there's a carpet that you see the best way is to enjoy it rather than think about what the price is, what, where was it made and all those kind of reactions. But you just enjoy the beauty of what's happening or you just try to be alert as to what is it that you can contribute to the society. And if, if there's something wrong with the carpet, shouting at it won't make a difference. Yeah, exactly. I just exactly. use that analogy because I showed it the I showed at the screen all the time. <laughs> yeah. mean, metaphorically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for sharing all of that. Um, I'll make sure, of course, as always, you know, regular listeners know we try to put links to all kinds of things that people mention in, in the transcript and stuff like that. So if you find this uh, in text form uh, on, our, on our website, uh, you'll be able to look up all the things that, that we're talking about. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to ask just before we move on to talking about your books, uh, you mentioned that you're, you're now doing work in sort of the banking and financial areas. And I was wondering if you could just maybe give us a specific example. You don't have to name a company or anything like that, but of, of the kind of work that someone like you would do in those areas. Yeah. So I think um, there, there's a part of business in banking that says intuition, like, you know, probably it start, we would, I, I'm not sure about how it started, but I would say that at start, we, when we want to provide a service to a customer, we probably say this is the kind of credit card that you would want for your spends. But right now with analytics, with the data which is at your tips and the kind of data which is available to us, I think it is it is making a, a lot more sense to kind of aggregate this data, go through the data and try to understand the customer, know your customer much better so that when you are selling across a product, it does not come across as a uh, something that the bank wants to kind of push or solicit, but also you're trying to understand the needs of the customer. That is, what is the kind of credit that you would want? And in case there's any fraud that is happening on your credit card, how is it that as a, as a bank, as a financial institution, I can protect my customer? So some of the examples which are there in banking that I have experienced or I have worked on would be credit and fraud risk. So on the credit part, it's more around underwriting a customer that is how much of line should be extended and which should be kind of a good trade-off or a break even between the risk that the bank is taking on this customer at the same time how much is the profit that is going to be generated by this customer if we are going to extend this line what is the kind of loyalty that the customer is going to show to us and what are the possible avenues that we can cross sell a product so if this customer has a home and an auto loan with us why not give this customer even a credit card because this customer is really uh, loyal to this bank, is spending and is also uh, paying back responsibly, then why is it that we cannot kind of uh, go a step ahead and proactively kind of touch base with the customer and say, what is it that you need and we are going to be here for you? Also, we do realize that during the customer life cycle, we do have our own um, 
uh, needs as a customer. So probably I've completed my education. I want to start a new uh, job or I want to kind of start a family. So for everything, we, we probably require different lines or different kind of cards and different kind of financial services. So I think that part is where I have worked on extensively, which is credit risk trying to understand and know your customer. Second part that I have also worked on is the fraud risk. So for example, um, if, if there is fraud on a customer's credit card, then you're not definitely going to be uh, enjoying spending on that card because you just got uh, fleeced off for a couple of hundred dollars. So you would want to be protected. You would want your identity to be protected. And how is it that as a bank, we can kind of help you? And at the same time, I would say it requires some amount of sensitivity because as a bank, if I find that this is potential fraud and I kind of decline this transaction, but if it's a genuine customer, it can kind of create a disruption. So if I've had a meal at a fine dining restaurant and somebody kind of declined my card, a bank declined and said, I thought it was, it was fraud and I'm not carrying cash. That's going to be super embarrassing and I'm never going to use that card ever again. So trying to understand where is it that we can kind of bring that balance is something that I have been working on. Yeah, thank you much for sharing, very much for sharing all of that. These are the kinds of things that we all kind of touch on from the kind of consumer end in our lives and rarely get a little bit of insight from the other side. Um, that that um, explanation you gave about fraud protection and what it's like to have something declined um, leads me to ask, ask a question. And it's basically, this is all just completely anecdotal on my part, but that kind of thing used to happen to me more regularly than it does now. Um, and I've always had this sense, and I've never been able to speak to anybody but that, uh, but about, about it directly, but that basically, particularly credit card fraud prevention as a craft has advanced dramatically in the last, let's say, 10 years or so. This is, again, this is just, I'm basing this on just my day-to-day -day observations, but also, you know, we were at LeanPub, we run an online marketplace, and I can, you know, I can see how our transaction provider has been improving in things like that as well. Is that true that things have dramatically improved in the last few years? I would definitely say yes. It has dramatically improved because uh, there are a lot of fraud rules that kind of go behind the scenes. So it's just in nanoseconds that somebody's swiping a card at point of sale at a, at a large retailer or going online and making that transaction. And I would say sub of five seconds is all the time that you require and you say this card is approved and this transaction is approved. But there are, I would say, roughly a thousand plus kind of rules that are going there depending plus minus depending upon the kind of bank that you're dealing with and the kind of algorithm that they have put in place so you do want to see something which is in pattern for the customer so for example just in a very layman kind of thing i'm living in wisconsin and suddenly my card starts swiping in new york and then it so the bank takes it upon itself to kind of reach out to the customer and say is this truly you or not but at the same time, they cannot make it like um, it's just going to be the zip code or something. So they would put something in like if it is me, I always shop at this retailer. I go there or also I'm having the same kind of ticket size or the same kind of spends. Then that makes sense. But of course, there are natural calamities like I would say uh, in a situation that I have come across. For example, if there are hurricanes or something and people are moving out of state, it it, it is it's not because it's uh, uh, it's not an out of pattern that you can kind of you know start declining because people will be moving out of that locality so you have to be kind of uh, up to date with what's going on so you cannot just have a fraud rule and say i'm done with it you also need to be aware of the uh, global scenario that's happening yeah, it's super fascinating what you said about, you know, in pattern and things like that, right? Because a lot of fraud prevention is looking for patterns. Um, and it's not just like you can kind of like find them all and you're done, right? Because the, the fraudsters are clever and they're constantly evolving and they they learn what pattern, they might even test a pattern just to see if it works um, and then test a new one to see if that works. And their plan is then to use it elsewhere or even to sell off the pattern that they've discovered to somebody who's better at exploiting. They're, they might be good at finding the patterns and other people might be better off at exploiting them and they'll do exchanges like that. And it, it reminds me a little bit of um, plagiarism. There's just, and the, the, when you talk about the algorithm, it's like, you can just start to tell, like not that we have a big problem with it at Limpa or anything like that, not at all, thank goodness. But um, uh, you can just kind of, there's just things that start to be obviously 
bad markers, right? Like, is someone buying the same product over and over again or something like that? You know what I mean from the fraud side or from the plagiarism side? Is it like, you know, does the style not match throughout the document and things like that? So it's, it's, it's a super, catching people trying to pull stuff off is basically really fascinating. And it's so, it's so interesting to know that, you know, like, that it really has, at least for me to say that it had, things actually have been improving. And it's partly because of the kind of techniques uh, that we're about to talk about uh, have been developed so well in the last few years. So uh, on to the, con- uh, the subject of your books and um, data. So I believe the first book you published on LeanPub is called What Just Happened? Descriptive Statistics and Explorer's Guide to Data. Uh, and I wanted to start basically with you where, where uh, that book starts with what's data. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I put that book, I put the pen to paper and I started with that book as the first book because I feel that 90% of our data is kind of uh, processed for something which is descriptive statistics and data as a whole has changed over a period of time because the data that we have been traditionally used to is the rows and columns kind of data and with the entire digital age things have kind of moved and with social media and smartphones we see that this data is not we don't get it in the traditional form anymore in addition to that uh, segment which is kind of diminishing in its share we are starting to get a lot of uh, social media data so something that we can uh, run sentiment analysis on something which is like in terms of graphics mri scans or something which is more like uh, uh, any of the social media uh, accounts that we have so a lot of data is in the free flowing form right now so what i did was in the initial book, I kind of gave the readers a feel about what are data and its types, like the structured, the unstructured form. And then what is the basic processing that goes for all of this data? So 90% or maybe more than 90% of it, I would say is processed for like the basic understanding of how this data is centered around its mean or what is the variance around it, or how is it like in terms of uh, the percentages or percentiles and the position of the data. So all of this, or whether this data is kind of looking normal and what is a normal distribution. So all of this is something that I kind of put as the first basic block in data science. And I truly believe that um, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's a Leonardo da Vinci uh, uh, quote. And I also believe in the Einstein quote that says that if you cannot explain it simply, then you have not understood it well enough. So I wanted it to be so easy that when I explain it to someone, it's like, I got it. So I wanted it to be really, really easy. And I made that attempt with these three books. Oh yeah, and I, I mean on that subject, yeah, I think you, I think you succeeded very well. They're very, they're very clear, and it's not, it's not, it's not only a matter of how they're written and how they're structured very deliberately, but actually the design and how they're presented, which is something we can talk about a little bit later. But they're very, they're very um, inviting without being patronizing, if you know what I mean. So you know, yes. it's, it's it's what's something that's come up because so many books on on Lean Pub are sort of prescriptive nonfiction, which is a publisher's term for what you know, books that show, explain things and tell you how to do them. Um, uh, it's always hard to strike a balance between like talking, t- how do you talk to a grown adult with the, who's just as smart and experienced as you are, but just in other things than the thing you're trying to explain to them. Uh, and that, that you, I think you struck that, that tone really well. Um, uh, you mentioned just a moment ago, descriptive statistics. And I was wondering if we could go into that a little bit more detail. What, can you give me an example of some, something that would be data in a, descriptive yeah. statistics study? The descriptive statistics, I would say, is broadly divided into a couple of categories. One would be the averages, which is the mean, median, mode. And what I did was I kind of went a little bit into deep into what is like a mean. Like we do know at times we say, okay, it's just an average. But then how is it that we'd want to compute this average if it is a, like a frequency or a tally table? Like if it's group data, then how do you deal with it? Like those kind of scenarios, like with a group data, with ungrouped data, with your frequency tables, how is it that you'll come up with this mean? which is the most uh, uh, easy or the most um, best estimate, I would say, the best estimate that you have when you don't have any other variable. So if I say like on any given day, I know that the past five days are running like in degrees Fahrenheit or like X, 
then I would just say the next day is going to be an average with no other information that is available to me. Then there was mode. So again, the same way, I kind of went into deep and tried to understand with group data, with ungrouped data, how do I kind of come up with this? So that is one part. The other part would be around variation. So I tried to touch upon every type of variation, not just the one that we know about, like standard deviation, the uh, normal one, but also like quartile deviation. Like how is it uh, around deviation or variances? What are the different kind of metrics that are available to us? I also looked at position of the data. So I'm trying to understand in terms of percentiles or deciles or quartiles, if you're going to like break up the data into four um, quadrants or four, I would not say quadrants, it would be like four parts. Where is it that this data is around? And looking at normal distribution and trying to understand whether this data is normal or not normal. So those kind of scenarios is what I kind of played around. I also touched upon visualization because I think that is where data really kind of is having that visual effect where we can kind of relate and kind of correlate things. So when is it that you would probably want to use a scatter plot to understand the correlations? When is it that you would want to show a bar versus a stack chart versus a pie graph? So those kind of things, like just put pointers out there saying, if you're using a month on month, then you might as well be uh, better off using a bar diagram versus a pie chart, which does not have that feature. So sometimes it does happen, like when we are on the start, we start with an analysis and we say we're going to go with a pie chart. And we, then we realize there's a time aspect to it. So these cu couple of things, which uh, maybe we are going to learn with the trial and error part of it, but I just kind of put down in notes, like this is where you should kind of use it. It kind of makes sense. Yeah, data visualization in particular is something that I think, you know, consumers of the news have noticed a big transformation in that uh, where prominent, you know, news sites have actually finally stopped complaining about having to be on, on the computer and decided to actually start taking advantage of, of, of all the opportunities that are available, both for processing data and then visually expressing it to people who are, who are um, uh, reading, reading their sites. Um, and that's been an amazing thing to see. You mentioned one thing before we go on to talk about the next book, um, you mentioned sentiment analysis. Uh, this is something I find really fascinating. It's basically, you know, when you hear, when you, when, when you're talking to someone, when you call a company up and you hear this, call may be recorded. Partly what that might mean is that there's going to be some machine that's going to basically listen to what you said and then try and decide whether or not that was a good interaction for you or not. Is that, is that, is that the kind of thing that, am I right about that that's what sentiment analysis is or am I wrong? It, it is, it is definitely. And I would say it is also, uh, uh, I would say that is one of the aspects also when they are looking at some of the things that are happening on the social media. So a good part of it is trying to catch a couple of positive words or negative words. And also there's a lot of advancement in the algorithm because they also have to uh, catch anything which is kind of contradictory because people can be sarcastic. They can say, thanks, I, I got late because of the flight. And now that thanks is not actually a thanks because we are just being sarcastic about it. So we have to understand it kind of the algorithm kind of depending upon how you're feeding that algorithm, how well it is monitored, are we going to get better algorithms? So it is definitely uh, advancing over a period of years and it's basically understanding the positive and the negative sentiments that are happening, which revolves around a couple of, uh, I would say, the um, uh, words that are being used in the entire conversation or the number of hashtags, the number of comments that are happening on the social media. So I think a lot of that is driving the interaction globally. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I can only imagine the challenges with having to uh, catch or register tone like that, like, you know, thank you very much, you know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't mean thank you very much. Um, and uh, that must be just a really fascinating challenge for people who work in that area. Um, uh, and so your next book uh, is Sampling Techniques, a Comprehensive Overview. And I was wondering if we could just start like we did with the first book. What, what's sampling? Yeah, so I think this is uh, an interesting piece because I feel if you get the sample right, then you have got your analysis right. And different samples can have different results altogether. And a very, uh, I would say a very uh, layman kind of way of putting it would be, um, you always have a biased sample and you always have an unbiased sample. So if I'm just going to give across like five movie tickets, that's more like I'm just 
uh, for anybody who has kind of shopped at this mall, if I'm just having some kind of a lottery and say anybody who's shopping at this mall, more than X dollars, you can just put your name in and I'm just going to kind of pick up a name out of this uh, lottery box or something like that. Uh, and it's just going to be something that I'm kind of giving out movie coupons. This can be something which is more like an unbiased kind of thing. So I would say this is the way I would explain an unbiased sample. But if you're saying I'm going to pick five people to represent uh, my school or my university or my college at a debate or five people to represent my country at the Olympics, then this is not going to be something which is like, you know, a sample which I can just go like, okay, I'll just pick these five people and I'm going to send them for a debate or for the Olympics. So in this case, you have to understand that there's a bias sample wherein you would want the somebody who's like the best in what they do, have a full grasp of that um, of that uh, topic or that subject or have trained a great amount. So I would say this is the way that I kind of put it, saying this is biased, this is unbiased, and then try to move into the different kind of uh, uh, sampling techniques that we have. And what I did was I kind of let go of some of the uh, theorems or the mathematical equations. And then I tried to explain the concept as to what is a cluster analysis and how is a two-stage analysis going to be considered or a snowball effect. And I kind of made a diagram to say, this is going to be the scenario in this kind of sampling techniques. So I did kind of try to put that flavor because I feel after the descriptive statistics, when we actually go to something which is more hardcore into analysis, it all depends upon the uh, sample that we select. And with the kind of data that we have, it's like running into millions and millions, at times billions of transactions, billions of um, uh, records, and we cannot actually process each and every record because that would be really consuming on the technology part of it. And it would be like a lot of coding and a lot of processing and you just have to wait for the output. But we would want to understand what is like a minimal viable product kind of thing, something which is like quick and dirty, just to understand where is it that we are landing benchmark or what is the ballpark number looking like before we go ahead with the analysis. So I think it's important that we kind of come up with a sample and then we can say we're going to replicate this on millions. Yeah, and getting the right proportion of the population, sampling the right proportion of the population to be confident that, you know, the sample is rep representative of general trends and things like that is also a challenge, I gather. I, I just wanted to circle back a little bit to what you said about bias. Uh, that is, that's such a fascinating concept because, um, you know, like a lot of us might think that, uh, you know, that means like you're prejudiced or some, or you're, you know, or something like that. But bias, and, and this, this example, I think has come up on the podcast before, when you're gathering, when you're gathering samples of information can be, for example, well, if you were doing a survey of how people intend to vote, let's say in a Canadian province, and the only method you used to try to contact them was afternoon calls to landlines, you know, it, absolutely you're not you're not that's a biased sample because who's home in the afternoon noon who has a landline and who answers the phone and actually answers surveys right like those are those are the that's the 100 percent of the people you interviewed those three things correspond to yeah so so that's basically what this book is going to give a flavor about to understand like what kind of population are you really looking at like are you looking for something which is very specific so if i'm looking for some uh polls or i'm looking for something which is like who's watching my uh, TV or my sitcom at this particular hour, rather than go and say that I'm going to look at the entire population, if you have this generic idea that you are targeting a segment, then why not filter and say, okay, I just want to exclude this, 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 and I'm going to ask the people that I'm targeting. Either we could use that approach, or if you want a segment that is for the general population, then it definitely does not make sense to have that time period, which is just noon, because there'd be, we'd be leaving out the entire population that is in the morning part or the evening part. So depending upon whom you're considering for this entire um, uh, survey, it becomes very important to kind of uh, have those uh, details in your questionnaire, because if I'm targeting something for a college student, and then I have my survey that's going to be uh, filled out by everyone who's not a college student, that kind of just defeats the purpose. And at the same time, if this is for the generic masses, and I'm just picking up 
people from like 21 to 24 and asking them to fill out that's definitely not going to give me the insight into somebody who is uh, a teenager or who is like um, in the middle age or somebody who is retired so if i want something that is going to be catering to the entire masses i have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that i require to have this survey properly filled out and not have these biases come in Yes, and of course, alternatively, yeah. If, if you want, if you want to be really focused, you better make sure you're you're not hitting the general population or something like that. You want to make sure that you've funneled funneled your sample to the to the right people. Um, yeah, just what I was just thinking of a real world example of how like this might all sound like the kind of things that banks and big companies get to use. But one interesting thing is that this kind of thing is being presented now as a tool to people in the products they might use online. Like I'm thinking specifically of sending email newsletters, for example, the service we use has a send time optimization feature, which is basically doing all, all kinds of like super sophisticated stuff along the lines that you're describing to decide like when emails should be sent out. Right. And it's, it, I'm sure it has profiles of when people at open emails and, you know, whether that's linked to region and time zone or what's in the subject line or what's in the content of the email and, and things like that. And it, it really is amazing. Like we're now entering into this age, you know, just like kind of with ordinary people like, you know, like me can access cloud computing, for example. Well, now all of these data analysis tools are becoming available to us. And it's not just, it's not only a matter of analyzing and understanding a situation, but actually like taking advantage of that information to be able to do what you're doing uh, better. Um, and so uh, the third book that you published on LeanPub is Big Data Analytics, Data Scientist Viewpoint. And so, uh, and I think people are gonna be getting a sense of the sort of progression and structure to the project. Um, what is uh, big data? Yeah, so I, I kind of put a feel into what is big data and why are we talking about big data and like how did this term come about? Like I just put a kind of a, a brief about like how is it that now it no longer matters about looking at a couple of customers but trying to understand the entire customer base and like trying to remove biases as much as possible, trying to include the entire population to make that decision and trying to understand how is it that my customer is reacting to a product? What are the sub-segments that are looking uh, specific? So for example, if I have a customer spend uh, exclusively on airlines or on large retailers or are more like a grocery kind of customers. So this big data is, is kind of meaningful because we are looking at millions of transactions and this is kind of, uh, after a point, it does not make sense to look at like just pockets, but we have to look at the entire uh, spectrum to get this holistic view and try to make a decision, make a data-driven decision. And then I did kind of put something about the IoT and trying to explain how it is that the ATM is the basic uh, form of IoT in, in, its, uh, uh, in its application form. So I just kind of gave that feel and I kind of put that out to the readers that everything that you just read in the first paragraph, that is data itself. And like now the data is no longer traditional and now we are moving across to free flowing text. And then I kind of put some kind of um, uh, structure around trying to understand how is it that we can uh, process this data. Like we can start with the descriptive part of it, then we can kind of sample it and then we can model it. We can build a storyline and then we can kind of present it and then we can run campaigns on it and then we can kind of monitor it. So I kind of gave an uh, more like a, a approach that we kind of practice on the projects. And this kind of helps people streamline because when we start with a project, it kind of gets a little overwhelming when you're dealing with a lot of data and at times we tend to do things sequentially and now things are going more agile and where we can do parallel processing wherein we can optimize the time we can start uh, being more productive but in the initial part of working on a project i would say in my experience it's something that we kind of learned over a period of time because at times we were doing things sequentially and then we realized after a project, after two projects, there are, there are some parts uh, that we can kind of do in parallel and that kind of uh, optimizes the time that is taken or spent on a project. So I think this is what I kind of put it out there so in, 
it's just kind of saying that these are the things that you right, require to think about. And once you just kind of have that brief roadmap, it kind of makes sense because you know, like when you're just working on a project, I have to do one, two, three, four, it becomes like a cookie cu a cutter structure. So it's much more streamlined. <clears throat> That's really fascinating. Um, I, I I really picked up on the uh, point you made that ATMs or automated teller machines were actually the first IoT or Internet of Things things that most of us would have encountered. And I'm I'm old enough to remember the days before they existed when you had to go into the bank and stand in line and you had like a little book that you wrote down your transaction in and stuff like that. And it it just never occurred to me before that my first experience with an Internet of Things thing was actually taking money out of a bank machine. But of of course it was. Yes, um, yes. So these are some of the things that we kind of take for granted. So because at, at times when you say IoT, it kind of gets overwhelming. But then when you kind of relate it to some concepts that you have seen in the real world and when you have experienced it, it kind of gets very uh, relatable. And what I did also put or uh, inject in this book is just a brief about like supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning and, and reinforcement uh, learning. So these are something which are like upcoming topics. And these are something that people have been spending a lot of time in, in terms of uh, uh, hardcore model building activities. And they are kind of getting some kind of trends and patterns from the data, which is kind of a little difficult for a uh, a person just to look at like millions of data and come up with something. So we are kind of using this collaboration with computers and understanding that we can collaborate and go much farther than just doing that as humans. So I've just kind of injected that part into the book. Yeah, actually, I, I specifically wanted to ask you um, uh, if you would, if you wouldn't mind explaining the difference between a supervised and an unsupervised learning model. So I would put it in a, a simple term is that supervised is when it is guided, when the data is labeled. So for example, if it is fraud and we have got historical transactions and we have labeled the fraudulent transactions as these are fraudulent transactions. So when the algorithm already has labels, it is, it's more like supervised because it's guided. They already know that this is fraud. And what they're tr just trying to do is from the millions of transactions that you have kind of fed it, it's going to come up with a trend or come up with a pattern and say, this is what looks like fraud. So they're going to make it generic. So I would say that is supervised. Unsupervised is wherein the person is not guiding it. You have just kind of put it all out there and say, this is what my data looks like just come up with some groups and categories. And an uh, easy way that I kind of put it is, is saying that if you are looking at uh, some kind of uh, soaps or detergents, maybe you are looking anything which is antiseptic or uh, uh, something that is going to kill bacteria as, uh, as a health soap versus something which is like a luxury soap, something which is a moisturizing soap. So all of them would have like different kind of groups that is coming across. But this is something which is more like unsupervised when you're just kind of trying to put across and trying to see what are the kind of groups that you're going to come up with. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great explanation of the, the, particularly the, um, the uh, use of the term label that, that a label can be attached to a, a, a piece of data or a set, a particular coherent set of data. And often uh, my understanding is that at, like people might think that all of this, everything is super automated because it's data and we're using computers, right? Uh, but actually often labeling and things like that, there's a lot of manual work that's done yeah. to set up data sets and make sure everything's right. Yeah, so th there is definitely a lot of work that goes in the background because for all of this data, you require to label it and you have to see that it is as accurate as possible and there is less error in the labeling itself because if you have labeled it, labeled that wrong at the start itself, you're going to end up with a very different analysis and you're going to have a very different rule set. So that is a lot of work that is put in the background. Uh, just moving on to the last part of the interview where we talk about your experience as a writer. So you've, you've written and published and designed these, these three books. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, just for the, the sort of current self-published authors out there or potential self-published authors out there, if you could describe your process, what, what app did you use to create your ebook files, things like that? So I always had this passion towards writing and I always knew that I'm going to like pen up, pen a book, but it was just something which was low on priority. And then I did put that high on priority and I just kind of, it started with like a bullet journal approach where I kind of 
put some bullets and said these are the main points or these are the main uh, uh, key takeaways for a concept and then it i just kind of brought that all together and as i started it and when i put the pen to the paper it kind of started flowing and then i started putting more illustrations out there because i wanted th- things to be more simple and i tried to make it as simple as possible so it was more around trying to make a mini series that was my objective because when i started writing i realized that it is exhausting and this topic is so huge that if i don't concentrate then i'm going to exhaust myself and at the same time i'm going to again make it a little bit more heavy and i want it to be as simple as possible so that somebody who is just picking up this book and has got no background in statistics no background in data science can just pick it up and say okay i got this concept and i got what people are talking about like what is the sampling techniques that people talk about what is big data analytics and what is the un cry about and what is the descriptive statistics so i wanted somebody to pick it up and say i don't want to look at something which is uh, too extensive i wanted to be very simple and i wanted to be out there and when i did this i gave it a shot and i said okay i'm going to make this like 100 pages let's start with 100 pages and let's see but i can put that together the second process was i did a little bit of research i did i would say it is not um, extensive but i would say it's it's mid range mid range kind of research and then i landed up with lean pub and it was it stated that this is kind of a simple platform this is an easy platform for self uh, publishing authors and then i said let's give this a try so i kind of logged into it i created this account and then i tried to see how easy that onboarding process is because it it was out there saying you know these are some of the top publishing platforms for people who are like rookies i am a rookie and i i have like no knowledge on this uh, self publishing front so i said let's give it a try and then i started onboarding and it was so simple it was literally 5 minutes and i was super amazed i was uh, i would say i was i got more enthusiastic after that i just kind of logged in and i said this is the title of my book and i was like this is created i was like okay i put it out then i have to put some content out there so it kind of gave me i would say it gave me that uh, it was a catalyst so to say so i had a uh, initial draft and the onboarding process was so smooth that i said okay i have to see this to the finished stage and that's how i got started with the first book and because that became so easy and it was so easy to navigate i said okay i had something which was like a draft copy of my second book i said okay let's try to make this uh, Uh, this book come out in like a quarter or something so i did that and then i started with the third book and i was like super happy and super excited about it and it was something which was uh, i would say it definitely caught my fancy because there were so many options like create a bundle run promotions and do all kind of stuff and i was learning a lot so it was uh, it was a great uh, learning curve for me i would say on this platform Oh, well thank you very much for the kind words we always like hearing that because we don't always hear them <laughs> but um uh yeah it's it's particularly you mentioned something that's particularly i think kind of interesting about lean pub which is that um often when um, often people who do you know publish books on lean pub it may be their first book it may be it may be in a sense the first kind of public thing that they've done and one thing that we do is the moment you the moment you create a book right which is the form you fill out to get started uh there's a landing page for that book Yes, that, that people is. can people can find if they search. Your name is on it, uh, yeah. and and you're already all out there. And you know, uh, people actually do often find it. Like you know, it's actually like, it's the little it's the little kick they needed. You know, like yes. it, it's it's real, and I'm actually out there. And you know, and and because a, a lot of the time, and like I know this because I have I have this experience myself. You know, you're kind of like a little bit scared. You're a little bit nervous. How is this going to come across? It's going to come across fine. People are going to come across are going to be in, if they're if they're not interested, they'll go away. If they are interested, they'll sign up and say let me know when the book is published. Uh and then it can be kind of exciting, right? Because while you're writing, you can actually be gathering an audience to be there for your launch. Uh, right from the start even before you've written a single word all you've got is a title and you've got a page but you can start gauging interest and yeah giving people that little that little little push out the door that they might if they're like me you know they might psychologically need to start doing stuff like that it it can really help um i did i did want to actually ask one specifically though uh, so what what program did you use to create your ebook files because i don't believe you used one of our writing modes you used our bring our, our your own book writing mode Yes, I did. So what I did was I uh, started with bring your own book 
and I kind of created that in a PDF form okay. and then I published that. So I was kind of exploring and I was trying to understand what is it that works best for me. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much for letting us know. Um, uh, so just wrapping it up, um, the last question I always like to ask uh, in these interviews, if the guest it happens to be a Lean Pub author, is if there was one thing uh, we could build for you, one feature we could build for you, or if there was one thing about Lean Pub that really bugged you that we could fix for you, uh, can you think of anything you would ask us to do? Honestly, I cannot think of anything. I am a happy soul on board. I'm still exploring and I'm <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm definitely excited and I'm definitely still exploring the opportunities to kind of understand how these features work and how the promotional activities work on LeanPub. And that's something that I'm kind of trying to figure it out. So I would say uh, it's it's been an easy learning experience and I'm still learning. So it's just been, a, it's, it's not even been a, a year on the platform and I'm kind of excited using and learning more about it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. And if you ever do think, if anything ever does really start to bug you, or if you ever do think of something that you'd like, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and, and let me know uh, what you're thinking. Uh, well, anyway, thank you very much for a really great interview uh, and, and for uh, really great descriptions of your books and what, what you're up to. And uh, thank you very much for being a Lean Pub author. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for having me. And thanks, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank you for reaching out. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter Podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a Lean Pub author yourself, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.